any this can't be that short of a meeting <laughs> you guys didn't all drive out here just for uh, a half an hour no I know, I know I just wanted to talk about the news media coverage and uh, your goals with that because uh, I'm afraid that it's going to die down and uh, I would like some you know it's not um, publicized enough where enough people are sympathetic and understanding of our plight. There's over 600 hospitals, Catholic hospitals in the country, and they could all be affected by this at some point. So I think that the news media needs to be on top of this, and I appreciate the GoPro uh, segments that you've had, but I'm afraid that the news media is going to die down. Um, uh, there's always a fear of that, especially in today's day and age, because it's, uh, you know, the, uh, the big story of 10 a.m. this morning is replaced by the big story of 11 a.m. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that uh, I have been in regular contact with most of the media outlets. Um, Go Local Prov has been the most active in terms of asking what's going on. Um, partially, the reason for the, I guess what I'd say is the lull in media, because I like the media on this case, not only because it keeps a little bit of pressure on everybody, but it's an easy way for me to get information out to everybody, um, because you don't have to go to a website, or so it can be in all over the place. Um, most are waiting to see what happens in February. That's kind of been that marquee date that everybody's put the uh, circle on their calendar for. Um, also, in, in defense of some of them as well, to the extent they need defending at all, uh, part of it has been me as well. As we get deeper towards identifying who I can potentially sue, I have to get much, much more uh, careful about what I reveal. I don't want to say something in the media. Mm -hmm. I'm the receiver, so if I say it, it's as, it's. Yeah. It would yeah. be one thing if one of you said something, yeah. but I'm the one who'd be pursuing against them. Yeah. And I'm very at this point, as each day ticks by and as each box of documents gets gone through, I'm sensitive to making sure that I don't say anything that could later be construed as either an admission or a waiver of something that I might be able to pursue against them. So I have gotten, I can tell you, I've gotten a lot of inquiry, inquiries, say, over the past 30 days, um, and you haven't seen a lot in the news about it because my answer has been we're, we're really focusing on reviewing the documents, and it's premature for me to say whether or not I think the diocese did X or Prospect did something yep. because I just don't want to... Uh, Litigation is litigation, and as much as I want to get as much information out to you as I possibly can, that's not going to help any of you if it ruins the case that we potentially may have against these parties. So that's kind of the, the balancing act that has to happen with yeah. the media. But I'm sensitive to the fact that the media coverage makes sure that everybody understands the impact of this on everybody in this room and everybody who's a member of this. And also that's a way for everybody to keep informed. Um, I can tell you nationally, this is being viewed with a, a interesting eye. Oh, good. I've, I've spoken to uh, state and city officials from many states across the country who have basically asked, what the heck are you people doing there and how's it going? Oh, good. Because we may have the same problem and if you found a way to figure it out, We'd like to piggyback. Yep. Um, so there's people around the country are watching it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, when you say the state, um, <laughs> yeah. So the question was: Is the state looking into anything? Um, on this to investigate any wrongdoing or anything like that. Um, uh, all I can tell you is, is what I have heard in the media. I do know that Governor Raimondo, Speaker Mattiello, and President Ruggiero have all asked for an investigation um, in connection with or in addition to 
my investigation. Uh, I can tell you that the court made it very clear on my appointment, I believe the hearing was the September hearing, that nothing that the court was doing should be considered or viewed as a substitute for any other investigation that either the Attorney General or the State Police or anybody could do. Um, the interesting rub there is that the Attorney General is one of those groups that I'm looking to to provide documents and I've had some difficulty. Not anymore, but I had difficulty getting those documents. Um, so the question is, is what exactly would the Attorney General be doing in the investigation, uh, especially when for all intents and purposes, I'm investigating that office. Um, so I, I can tell you that I have not, but I have spoken to the governor, the speaker, and the president, and on more than one occasion, um, but I have not spoken to anybody from the state police, um, although that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not investigating. Uh, state police usually play play it pretty close lip, closed lipped um, until they actually have something to report that they've revealed that there's a problem. Uh, so it's possible that the state police could be investigating, but I'm not aware of it at this time. I have to tell everybody regarding the state police, we had a little uh, gathering in front of uh, church one day, and the state police was there, and she was all for us. She really, she was a real, really nice person. I, I do believe that if the state police are investigating, again, I don't know if they are, but they would look to see if there was something. I mean, obviously the state police investigation would be with an eye towards criminality, um, and so they would have to do some investigation. I would assume at some point they may contact me um, if they are investigating, but again, other than what I've seen in the newspapers and the media reports regarding a state investigation, that's all I'm aware of. Hi. Just wondering if there's been any further um, consideration for those of us who applied and are on hold? Yes. The, um, I'll, I'll answer that quickly with a yes, and then I'll give you a little explanation. That is another issue I plan on addressing on, uh, at the end of February. So the two things that I was going to be reporting to the judge on um, and asking the judge about was regarding the court's, uh, the court's power to authorize me to do something. Um, in addition to the adjustment to benefits, that was also the, the time frame that I said I wanted the court to stop benefit applications from being processed, keeping everybody's place in line preserved, um, but I believe that it would be prudent to address that issue as well at this time. And again, under the same, uh, for the same reasoning that I said with the PBGC, um, it's, don't hold me to this right now, um, but it's likely that I'll be asking the court to, in essence, flip the switch back on and allow those applications to be processed. Um, of course, with everybody understanding that that will cause a faster drain on the money because that's more money out than the 853 that we've been paying out since uh, August. Hello, Mary. A couple of things, Steve, about the publicity or the lack thereof. One concern I had when I read on Go Local Prov, was it last Friday you were interviewed? Part of the document underneath stated that the, the hospital had not contributed to the pension plan for 40 years. That is not true. Am I yeah. correct? That is not true. Okay. Um, the plan was there were several contributions over the life of this okay. plan from the hospital. I didn't see that. Yeah, it um, was in the little blip underneath, <clears throat> and a couple I'll, of people called me asking me that question. I'll check and I on said, that. I don't think that's true. Yeah, that's. Was it the, the hospital or the diocese? I can't remember which they said, okay. but they said they had find, found out that they hadn't had contributions for 40 years. I will check on that, and okay. I will, if, it's, uh, if it was a statement that's incorrect, I'll ask uh, okay. Go Local to make a correction. The second answer to the question about publicity, I'm aware that the union is working with their PR person 
to look to see what's happening at the State House and to um, organize a rally of all of us that are pensioners at that time, bus us to the State House to go in and listen to testimony, et cetera. And they were basing it on, I believe the Senate President, a couple of months into this, made a statement that he was going to put in legislation about class action suits? Uh, joint tort feasors. Yeah. Yes. And to my knowledge, none of that has been done yet, but the PR for UNAP is working on that. So we should be hearing something. They were aiming for January, but obviously they didn't make it. I can, I can tell you that um, the joint tort feasor legislation, which is similar legislation that was put in place for the Station Nightclub as well as for 38 Studios, um, there was a discussion with the Senate President and the Speaker about putting similar legislation in to cover this case. Um, we were told that they would. Um, I know the session just technically began about mm -hmm. a month ago, um, so I don't know the status of that at this point, um, but I have no, uh, I've got no reason to doubt that it's going to be introduced and passed by both the Senate and the House. Um, I can also tell you that I've spoken to a number of state leaders, not necessarily the president and the speaker themselves, but other reps and senators who are interested in, although this doesn't necessarily help the people in this room, but to prevent this from happening again, have asked for recommendations on language uh, to tweak the Hospital Conversion Act, mm. as well as to tweak other or add uh, statutes to the Rhode Island General Laws, which will require certain funding uh, minimums and certain reporting requirements that ERISA or that a church plan was required to because it was under was not under ERISA. So there are there's a lot of interest in not only what's happening now, but also okay we can't prevent what happened in this case. But what can we do to make it better so that there's no question? Um, and I've also spoken to candidates uh, for the various offices, like the Attorney General's office, who are interested in doing the same thing. Great. Thanks. Karen? Just out of curiosity, I was wondering, <laughs> has uh, either Prospect or Charter Care made any statements to you whatsoever, or any kind of communication, or are they just waiting for the shoe to drop? And say they, nothing. Well, Prospect uh, was a uh, issued a subpoena, um, and they have been providing documents. They've participated, um, I would say, uh, more tangentially, more off to the side, in a couple of the motions to compel and whatnot, mostly because, for example, if I'm filing a motion to compel the St. Joe's entity to provide me with documents, from their negotiations with Prospect. Prospect will come in and say, well, wait a second, we were a party to that transaction and we don't want that document to go. So we have our subpoena, which we're gonna say, here's what we'll give you and this is what we want to be protected, but we wanna get in before they reveal something that we didn't want to. So they've been involved in that way. Um, but uh, I'm at least happy to say with regard to Prospect, I have not had to, special counsel hasn't had to go on an emotion to compel them. Uh, their responsiveness has been in a timely fashion um, and in accordance with either what we originally requested or in accordance with uh, mutual agreed upon extensions or, or move deadlines. Um, and they have provided what's called a privilege log when you give documents. There are certain, certain documents that you produce and say these are the ones that we are claiming a privilege on, attorney-client privilege or things like that. Um, their privilege log compared to the number of documents they provided was quite small. Um, it may sound like a lot, but it was about 300 documents, um, at least in, in the majority of their submission, and that's not a large percentage. Um, so they are at least providing documents in a timely manner and it does not look like they are seeking to withhold much. But they're not exactly offering anything extra information-wise, just what they have to? I'll, I'll say this, and I, uh, for those of you who saw my interview on Friday, I said it there. Um, it's unfortunate because we're not in litigation right now, um, but everybody's acting as if we're in litigation right now, um, and that's 
a function of you're asking for documents for us, which we know are part of an investigation, which the goal is to identify who you're going to sue. So we're going to protect ourselves as we can through the law and not provide you with information or to ask that it be restricted to the extent we do provide it to protect ourselves. Um, and while I don't fault uh, anybody for doing that as a lawyer, it's frustrating in this process because I'm not in litigation yet and I just want to see what the heck happened. Um, and every time I have to run into court, it costs money, time, and it's usually because somebody doesn't want to give me something. So on multiple levels, it's frustrating. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Uh, in, the, in the event there is a settlement, our settlement offer, who will be involved in the decision to accept that? How will that work? Let's assume Prospect offered, I don't know, $30 million. Okay. So under a receivership, the way that it, it generally works, and I don't expect it to work much different in this context, is I have the authority along with special counsel to engage in settlement discussions and to negotiate what I believe, and special counsel believes, is a reasonable settlement mm -hmm. based on what we understand and the claims we think we can bring and the time and money that it would cost to pursue it. Once I come to, let's assume hypothetically, that I come to an agreement with Prospect, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the example yes. you gave, um, that we will settle for X, whatever X is, then I have to present that to the court. I don't have the authority to enter into that settlement without the court giving me the express authority to do so. And I have to set forth the terms of the settlement and the reasons why I believe it's in the best interest of the plan and the participants to accept that settlement. Mm -hmm. And then the court will rule on that and anybody who wants to come in and say that they disagree that that's in the best interest can do that. But I will tell you that it is usually um, because as, as lawyers you make claims. And I can say to Prospect, we have these seven claims against you and we believe that those seven claims that we have damages flowing from those totaling $10 million. Um, you and I both know, anybody who has ever been involved or seen a lawsuit, know that the likelihood of recovering the full $10 million on civil contract claims or things of that nature, there's risk. Litigation has risk inherent in it. There's also a cost associated with it. So to pursue a claim of $10 million, maybe somebody like uh, Max says to me, Steve, I've got, I give us a 70% chance to recover 80% um, of that money. So I'm down to $8 million and it's going to cost us a million dollars to pursue it. So now I'm down to seven. Now if I get an offer of 6.5 million payable today, as opposed to waiting three years to litigate with a risk that Max would be right on his $7 million estimate, I'm running that risk for half a million dollars. It could cost more, we could get less than the 80%. So it's that type of a balance that has to be done, but that'll all be presented to the court, and the court will ultimately determine whether or not the settlement is reasonable and that I should enter into it. Does, does the advisory committee at all play in this decision, or do they, does their job end after we come up with the initial distributions? Yet the advisory committee is in place for benefit adjustments, not for litigation strategy. Um, so while this case continues on, to the extent that there is a trust that has assets that are paying assets to you as beneficiaries, um, as things happen, I need that advisory committee in place because 
what the advisory committee decides on April 1 may need to be changed on August 1 because mm -hmm. something happened to the market or we got money in or something. Um, so that advisory committee is really going to be a fluid committee with regard to benefits, but not involved at all in litigation or settlement. I see. The, uh, I think at a previous meeting, you mentioned the fund was roughly $125 million shot. Was that accurate? Say that. Was say the that. fund about $125 million shot of the full funding at a conservative future estimate would require? Oh, to, if to get enough money yes. today to fund the plan 100% for the rest of its life, for, for the, the life that it needs, mm -hmm. it's approximately 118. 118. So yes. Yeah. It's a lot of money to get from settlements. It's a lot of money to get from settlements. Um, it is uh, it is a lot of money to get from settlement, and that's what I think I've said here before, that it's, um, it's not a number that I want people to focus on because it's unrealistic to think that claims against the individual parties would result in a $118 million recovery, and even if it did, there's... There's lawyers' fees and things like that, so it's still going to be something you'd have to be somewhere around 130, 140. Um, that does not mean, however, that one I can't be hopeful that somebody won't necessarily write me a check for 118 million, but will take on the responsibilities for the plan, um, which would in essence be the same thing. It just wouldn't come out at once, um, or that I couldn't convince something like the PBGC to step in and uh, take over the plan at the limits that the, uh, the federal law permits for PBGC funding. Uh, <clears throat> some of the entities involved will probably have some applicable insurance, such as directors and officers. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if there's a pension liability type policy, but it may exist for larger corporations. It's called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Just that? Just that. So there's yeah. no individual? There's no, no, the insurance for pensions is that uh, PBGC. Um, and you don't have to contribute, and thus you aren't covered if you are a church plan. Mm -hmm. um, so the insurance that is in place for ERISA plans is the PBGC. And the reason why those two go hand in hand is because if you're in a risk plan, you have minimum funding requirements on an annual basis, you have minimal reporting requirements to your participants, and so that's something where the PBGC can say, okay, on an annual basis, you're required to have at least some responsibility, and so we're going to ensure it because we can at least see that you're doing what you're supposed to do on a minimum level. A church plan does not apply those those protections don't apply, and so therefore the PBGC does not have to insure. Even uh, DNO, I think, excludes pension liability. Say that at one Some of the DNO policies ex exclude pension liability issues. Some of them, some of them might mm. and do, um, but those would go more towards, and I, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and be an expert on those policies right now because we have not engaged with any of the insurers because we haven't made claims yet. Mm -hmm. um, but those would apply more to probably the board of St. Joe's yes. than, say, Prospect or the diocese or the investment manager or something like that because they had they were not managing the plan. They were kind of separate on the side. Correct. Um, <clears throat> last thing I want to say, Max Wistow is certainly an uh, uh, excellent attorney. I uh, had many dealings with him in the past, and he was usually very successful. So if, if we had to select an attorney, I can't think of anyone really much better than he. So. That's one of the reasons why I, uh, the court and I decided that it would be good to bring him in. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Just wondering, uh, is there any time limit that you're running up against as far as, let's say, you have 10 years between when they, when we, they offered the, the pension and when you take action? Is there, are you, is there any kind of a time constraint where you have to do things in a certain amount of time? 
Um, or will it expire? Yeah, the difficulty in that question is I want to do something now. Um, so this is, you know, every day that ticks by, especially if, um, as I stated before, especially if I ask the court and the court authorizes me to flip the switch on applications, the only money that's coming into this plan is investment income. Um, we happen to be in a good place for the market right now, um, but I'm not confident that that's going to stay that way for an extended period of time. We've already been in this kind of upward trend for about 10 years, and the market is cyclical. Um, so I'm concerned every day um, that I'm going to wake up and I'm going to hear that the, the market corrected <clears throat> and that the plan that had $86 million in it today has $72 million in it tomorrow just because of a market correction. Um, so I want to move as quickly as I possibly can. Um, and I've taken steps to try to protect the assets, be a little bit more conservative, which while on the one hand protects the assets, on the other hand it generates less investment income. The more conservative that the investment is, the less return you're likely to get. Um, but so I want to move as quickly. There is no specific time frame, but obviously it doesn't help if the money's all gone. So I've got to I've got to make sure that we do something to protect what's there now before it disappears. Which is, as you know, part of the discussion of the advisory committee is how do we extend the runway as long as we can, um, while we try to figure out what we can get in uh, from the different claimants. So that's why the delay in getting the documents has been so frustrating, uh, because if I thought I was going to have the documents all by December 1, December 15, I'd be in a position on February 1 with Attorney Wistow to sit down and talk about real viable claims that we could pursue. Because that December 1, 15 date has now been pushed to December 15, February 1, that pushes me out another 45 days, and again, that makes me nervous. Um, I, I need to move as quickly as I can with everything that's happening here, and every day that I am delayed in doing that, it makes me scared. I understand that. I guess what I was meaning to say is, is there a statute of limitations on when any action can be taken oh, on okay. this particular that's a different thing? Question. <clears throat> it's like, you know, five years down the line, they could say, oh, that's it, your time's up, you can't, there, you there can't do anything. There is a statute of limitations on the claims. Um, I have already discussed with Attorney Wistow um, entering into what's called a tolling agreement. So that's where you contact the different parties that you might have a claim against and say to them, we may go past, let's say the statute of limitations deadline is May 1st. We may not be bringing a claim against you by May 1st, but we'll agree that you won't say that we're precluded from bringing it after May 1st because we've agreed to toll it for a period of time. Um, how long that is, whether they'll agree to that or not, is something I don't know yet because we have not broached the topic yet with them. And some may say yes, some may say no, and that may affect what I do. So they may, by not agreeing to a tolling agreement, put more pressure on me to bring a claim more quickly, maybe even possibly faster than I feel comfortable with based on the information, just because I don't want to blow the opportunity. But we do have an eye on all of those claims and the deadlines for all of them, and we have discussed that. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, I will be here as usual for at least a few minutes after this. But I want to thank everybody again for coming out. Please drive safely. Um, we will do another one of these again. And then the next hearing uh, that we know of is going to be the end of February. There may be one beforehand. Thank you.